my dissertation research, which focuses on contemporary processes of translation and mediation, uh, broadly speaking, of indigenous knowledge in the Americas. And I'm going to be quick. Um, I think um, my attempt is to nurture a critical, renewed bond between translation studies and anthropology, engaging both with a claim for the decolonization of thought. I believe that engaging in translation is a political as well as uh, a cosmological quest. It is indeed a cosmopolitical quest. As I recalled on Monday, Bruno Latour says we need to give up the validating idea of one world of nature. We need a war of worlds to replace the flesh of civilizations. He says that one world does not exist and has never existed. It is there to be made. And uh, as I suggested, it has to be translated. According to Latour's interlocutor uh, and Belgian philosopher Isabelle Stanguer, the cosmopolitical is a deliberate defection from worldhood. Opposed to the Kantian cosmopolitanism that says politics should aim at allowing a cosmos, a good common world to exist, Isabel Stonguet explains in uh, her text the cosmopolitical proposal that the whole idea of cosmopolitics, and perhaps we could say of translation too, is to slow down the construction of this common world. And slowing down here means stopping the rush to consensus, as Lin constantly reminding, reminds us. It means opening up the chance of a common world, which, which is the opposite of a, a place of transcendent peace or of a transparency of meaning. So just a few preliminary notes, and I resorted to the notion of translational equivocation, as you remember, proposed by um, ethnologist Eduardo Vera de Castro, and I will now show you a few aphorisms I selected in his work that illustrate the connection that bonds equivocation and translatability together, and that might be inspirational for the themes of this project. So, to translate is to si situate oneself in the space of equivocation and to dwell there. To translate is not to unmake the equivocation, since this would be to suppose it never existed in the first place, but precisely the opposite. To translate is to emphasize the equivocation, to open and widen the space imagined not to exist between the conceptual languages in contact. To translate is to presume that an equivocation always exists. It is to communicate by differences instead of silencing the other by presuming a univocality between what the other and we are saying. <coughs> to translate is to compare what's in incomparable. It is to measure what is incommensurable. Now, as I dwell in the space of equivocation, I wanted to take this opportunity to share some ideas on where my early stage PhD research on translation and indigenous people should have now. My purpose is to unfold this notion of equivocation into the issue of translating the poetics of Amerindian peoples, such as shamanic songs, ritual, chants, or other genres that I'm yet to discover. Uh, of course, the use of this notion of poetics is very complicated, and I'm not going to spend time today uh, diving into that, but hopefully I will have a chance in the future to share my thoughts with, about that with you. And I'm just starting to get familiar with the, uh, with the situation of uh, the translation of Amerindian poetics, poetics in North America, but I can say that in Brazil that bridge is yet to be crossed. Uh, more literal translations are still prevalent, even though that's starting to change, especially uh, 
because of the work of some former students of Eduardo Verde de Castro who are trying to experiment with form and content in translation. Um, so when I say uh, translators, I'm also thinking about processes of curatorship, uh, film directors. And at some point, I will have to narrow down my scope and to uh, you know, choose what methodology I'm actually resorting to. The good thing about working with Lee is that we don't have many a priori, and our project project can be, you know, very open until our qualifications. <laughs> so let's see how it goes. And um, I have just uh, some final remarks. I think it is important to question to what extent the distinguishing Amerindian emphasis on alterity, transformation, and exchange might affect transcription, orthographization, and translation procedures that rely on graphocentric and representational biases epitomized in a typically Western emphasis on creation and production. Concerning the transmission of narratives, whether on a book, in a classroom, at an exhibit, I wonder how professionals dealing with Amerindian texts can engage with alternatives that enforce translational reflection rather than merely criticize the crystallizing display of native sounds, images, and speech on pages of printed paper. I believe that rendering these indigenous source languages that go beyond the limited scale of national or monolingual frames into target languages involves taking seriously the sensorial experience, conceptual imagination, and multimodal practices that are key to the indigenous peoples of the Americas. In other words, I would argue that the translation of Amerindian theories must go hand in hand with an Amerindianization of translation theories. I think this proposal is aligned to what Fuyuki Kurosawa proposes in his article Global Justice as Ethical Political Labor and the Enactment of Critical Cosmopolitanism, uh, which is the following, that the intent of reformulating cosmopolitanism can benefit from listening to, debating with, and learning from non-Western traditions of thought. A proposal akin to Walter Mignolo's diversity, a vision supported by the necessary epistemology of border thinking in a pluricentric world built on the ruins of ancient non-Western cultures with the debris of Western civilization. Uh, and, um, on the other hand, since we are in a context of a world language dominated scenario, the matter of the predominance of English also rises. We need to constantly, constantly question in name of whose cosmos this new call for translating indigenous arts or uh, knowledge in general is being enunciated. Which brings us back to Bruno Latour's common world and Isabel Stanguer's cosmopolitics. We talk about making room for more and more translation, but would it be possible to build a common and comprehensive pan amerindian framework for indigenous, for translating indigenous knowledge without translating it into English? Would the possibility of translating indigenous texts into languages other than English create novel modes of comparability and translatability beyond the privilege of Anglophonia. Uh, and uh, to what extent, and I think this is probably the, the most important question I have raised so far, to what extent the preponderance of nation-based studies, mother tongue approaches, strictly verbal approaches, like linguistic uh, approaches, or strictly visual approaches as we are usually done in the anthropology of art field or history of art field. Uh, to what extent uh, this preponderance has inhibited a more profound 
analysis of modes of translation proper to Amerindian peoples. So these would be my preliminary questions so far. And just to conclude, uh, the main goals I have listed so far are to identify challenges proper to processes of translation and mediation of indigenous knowledge in the Americas, which I think is a very <laughs> ambitious goal. Let me, let's see how it, it moves on. And to approach multimodality as a key characteristic of Amerindian narrative, which is constituted by a complex intersemiotic web of oral, musical, and visual elements. And last but not least, to track terminological choices made by scholars who have been working on Amerindian narrative and analyze the limitations of labels such as indigenous art and indigenous literature. Thanks a lot, everyone.